Hello, good morning and welcome back to the fish lot there, out on the shore. The idea today, hopefully today, I wanted to do some foraging, foraging along the rocky shore. But as you can see, the conditions are quite rough. I'm tucked in here out the wind, it's, yeah, it's probably 35 mile, <laughs> probably 30 to 35 mile an hour winds today. And we have, I would give it probably five or six foot of swell every two or three seconds. Yeah, so it's rough. I'm down here two hours before low tide and the plan was to follow the tide down to the low tide line and forage around for things like crabs and lobsters in all the rocks and rock pools. I will explain this in videos before if you've already seen it forgive me if you haven't this is new information for you. There can be certain conditions that can either make the tide go further out or can hold the tide back. Like high air pressure can force the tide further out but conditions like this <laughs> hold the tide back so normally on a calm day the tide would already be further out because this wind and this waves are holding the tide fingers crossed by the time we get to low tide which is in about another hour and three quarters the tide will have gone out far enough for me to do it better foraging tides are large spring tides just because the low tide line is further out and areas are uncovered that aren't normally uncovered so you get to find things that aren't normally exposed. We'll have a rake around at the high tide line because this rough weather it does mean that it's usually good for beach combing. There's a lot more things that are washed up on the high tide line and I've just spotted one here, I'll walk down to it. Really. We'll have a rake about on the high tide line for half an hour and see what the tide does. If the conditions drop off we'll go and have a look at all the rocks and the rock pools. rough like <laughs> this is a pickup boy because it's got a handle on it so you can pick it up now I can I'm gonna keep this and I'm gonna use this for the pots yeah it's got a handle on it so you can pick it up it's called a pickup boy what I'm gonna be doing I've took myself out of the wind I'm down in some shelter here what I'm going to be doing is looking down along all like the cracks like this. This is still quite high up on the tide line, so you're unlikely to find anything big up here. If you're going to find anything, it's going to be like little tiny crabs. Like I can see a little tiny one in that hole there. But yeah, I'm going to be looking in all these cracks and crannies for anything. While I'm waiting for the tide to rub off, I'll talk to you about what we've got around here. This time of year is some of the best time to forage for seaweed because it's all starting to grow fresh, it's just coming through. Like this, this pepper dulse that you see here. This is a flat fernway, this is pepper dulse. The reason why it's called pepper dulse is because it's got a very pepper, even well, at the moment it just tastes like salt and pepper because it's salty, but it's salt and pepper. This time of year when it's all the same colour is the best time to get it. As soon as you start getting into like April, May time, the ends of it start to go yellow and it's, it's past its best. But other things are just starting to come through as well, like your bladder racks are all fresh, your sea lettuce is just coming through. There's more sea lettuce over that tuca. All this rough weather that we have through the winter, it's just the cycles that go through nature. All the summer time is generally the warmer time, the calmer time, everything grows, everything's at, like at its full size. Through the winter, because there isn't as much sunlight and because of all this rough weather, all of the old seaweeds die off, get ripped up, all end up getting washed in, like these big rafts of it here. It all gets ripped up, so it gives space for the new growth to come through for next year. On the stalks of these old ones, this is all pom-pom weeds and that there. What I'm going to do actually, I'm going to switch to a different camera so I can show you close up. These are your flat fern weeds, these are your pepper dulse. Then you move over and you have pom-pom weed. It's called that because when it attaches to things it almost looks like a pom-pom. And this here 
and that there is called bunny ears. It's segmented to the point where it almost looks like bunny ears. You've got some little purple and little orange sponges, pink coral weeds. There's a green sponge there. And everywhere you've got loads of these little tiny barnacles. You've got purple top shells, dog whelks, limpets. There's a dog whelk. Now these ones predate on the other ones. So they'll, all your purple top shells and your winkles and your limpets are all grazers. They just go around eating algae. These ones feed on those ones. This maybe better shows you the pom-pom weed. You see how it sticks to the ends like a pom-pom. This has all been kind of cut short by the rough weather. One of the negatives of this rough weather when you try to do this type of foraging is whenever you get a lot of turbulent water, it moves a lot of sand about. And the holes which the crabs and the lobsters live in sometimes get filled full of sand. Now they're not stupid. They don't like getting trapped in a hole. So if there's a lot of sand moving about, they move out of the holes and go into deeper water. Also you'll find this with all this rough weather and when the seaweed getting thrown about, you'll find a lot of seaweed jammed in a hole. Generally, if a hole is full of seaweed, there's not there isn't a crab or a lobster in it. Because they like a tidy home, they're clearing everything out of the way. In fact, one of the telltale signs of how to spot whether there's a crab or a lobster in a hole is usually everything outside of it will have been pushed out of the way. Hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to show you. But yeah, this is this here is devil's tongue weed. Let's see if we've got anything under here. Just a little furrowed crab. Oh no, there is a prawn there as well. He's too fast to catch by hand. And here's the rain. These rock pools higher up on the shoreline, you don't have to go out on massive tides to get to these. These are accessible from pretty much any state of tide. So if you just wanted to come down with your kids and do a little bit, you don't even need to bring your kids come out and do some rock pooling this is perfect and all you want to do is you want to look for a pool that's got a little bit of water in with some flat rocks and just gently turn them over now you have to be fast to see them there was a couple of fish in here and they've bolted let's see if I can't find them in a second there is a little tiny brown edible crab he was trying to make his little sneaky getaway in you. Another male furrowed crab. These are also called a pie crust crab. Xantho incisors. One thing you need to make sure though, if you ever lift a rock up, that you put it back down. See if we can't find where them fish are. Well and truly gone. They'll be tucked up somewhere in one of these little holes. Oh, there is a very cute little cushion star. One of the things you might notice is that when you, as soon as you get a sheltered spot, just keeping an eye on these waves here, duck down. As soon as you get a sheltered spot like this, you get a lot more seaweed. Anywhere that's out on the open, all the seaweed gets ripped off. So you're looking down in areas like this. It's just like, I explain it to people like looking at an open field. You don't generally see things in the middle of an open field because there's no cover, there's no shelter, there's no security. Everything's down by the hedges or in the woods or in the bushes. Well, it's the same here. 
this serrated rack. You can tell it's serrated rack because it's got serrated edges. Bladder rack. Yeah. As we're starting to move further down the tide line, we're starting to get more seaweed, bigger seaweeds as well. You can see longer ones. Up at the higher tide line, it's only really stuff that's short that can cling onto a rock because that's the area where most of the most of the turbulence is. If we get down far enough, we might get amongst the kelps today, I don't know. But this is like what we're looking for. You see like this little hole here? Look. If that had been further out, I reckon that would have had something in it. It's going to be one of them days today, isn't it? Well, at least it stopped raining. Oh, there was some fish. Only little ones though. What have we got here? Right, I can see <laughs> I can see about seven different species. We've got some little shrimps and prawns. We've got ever so many furrowed crabs. That's it. Another one in there. There's a little velvet swimming crab that's just swum under the earth. We have some little variegated scallops. These here, these white worms, they're a polychaete worm called a keel worm. We'll find more of those as we get further down the tide line. Right, there's the fish. Oh, there, look, by my hand. Ah, oh, can't get it. Need two hands. I'll get the next one. Right there. Oh, too fast. There and there. Those are pipe fish. They are a relation. Oh, there's loads. Once you get your eye in. Look. That is a relation of the seahorse. That wire weed there is actually an invasive seaweed from Japan. Oh. Just crabs and more pipe fish. There was a fish that skittered but he's too fast for me. And that's a little squat lobster. Yeah, look. Yeah, if you're going to come down here with like a little shrimping net and a little clear bucket, have a great time just rooting around. Yeah, I mean, I've probably seen 15 different species of rock pole, rock pole creatures here. It's not looking like tide's going to go out.
you believe it? That really big rock. Oh, there it is. Little baby velvet swimming crab. I was going to say, look at the size of that rock, and it had an out. And this one that was half the size had two crabs underneath it. Oh, there we go. The mother load. One, two, three, four, five, six. And there's several little ones on the back of this rock. Now there's a pretty one there. That is a snake locks anemone. You look at those under a UV light and they glow. In fact, what I'll do is I'll put a clip in here now of what it looks like under a UV light. This crab has actually got a parasite in it. See that under there, that like blister? That is a parasite. In fact, it's called a hacker barnacle. Blenny. This is where I'm going to be looking down along the cracker there. That there, I don't know if you can see, there's like a load of dust that's been pushed out. Keep an eye on that. There's a crab there, look. See it? Just as I said, we're looking in like all little holes. Now that one, I know that one's too small, so I'm not even gonna bother trying to drag it out there. But yeah, that's what we're looking for. I've just seen a red antenna down there. There, look. There it is. There is a lobster down there. I don't know how well you can see it. That was it, that was that was the telltale giveaway. Sorry, one second. If you can see the red antenna down there, and I can just as soon see a blue leg. So that was it, that was the giveaway. I just so all I was doing was looking in the cracks and the crannies and looking out. The main two things that you're gonna spot will be them antennas. I don't quite know how hard it's going to be to get out of there. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go around the back of the rock to make sure it can't escape out the back. Which that, that might have a hole in it that might be four foot deep. There look, there's the antenna. Can't see from seaweed. There it is. Tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna end up either getting soaking wet or this camera's gonna get soaking wet. So I'm gonna set you up on a tripod over there and I'm gonna try and get this lobster on. Actually, I've just noticed by my feet as well.
There's a weight from a diver's weight belt. <laughs> There's a weight from a diver's weight belt though. He's probably been down here trying to get this lobster out when tide was in. <laughs> Well, I'm soaking wet up to my elbows, but I got it. The main, thing to, <laughs> the main thing to take away from this is I got it. But if anything could go wrong then, it did go wrong. First of all, <laughs> I tried to set the camera up onto a tripod to try and like, watch it coming out. And then the tripod fell over and landed in the water. And then when I went to go and pick the tripod up, my tripod has broken. And then I nearly lost the lobster because it was getting away and I'm wet up to my elbows. But I got it. There we are. You just stay in there, lad. And I've also found a weight for my weight belt. Yeah. I'll regroup, get myself sorted out, try and drain some of these water out because I'm wet up to my elbows. And then we'll, <laughs> we'll move further up the tide line. Yeah. Just in time as well because the tide started to turn. That's more of that bunny ears there. This is just a foraging hook. That I used to kind of tempt the lobster up with. There he is. Stunning look. Stunning blue. This is what gave you away, lad. This lobster is a male. You see it's a male by these two white dots by my thumb here. There are a few bylaws in Cornwall pertaining to lobsters. The first one's minimum landing size. So it needs to be 90 millimeters from the back of the eye to the back of the carapace, that area there. This one here is, he's a, well, I know he's way over, he's probably closer to 100. The next one is, you're not allowed to land egg-bearing lobsters. You see, this is a male, there's no eggs there. The next one is no V-notches. A V-notch would be in this one or this one. No V-notches. So this guy is coming home with me. You've got an invite to dinner, son. I'm absolutely buzzing about that. That's a that's a cracker. Now I've just put a bit of seaweed over it. Yeah, the tide's turned now, and as you can see, there is a flipping mahusi of great rain cloud on its way. So that's the perfect time to start heading back. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to walk up and walk back along the high tide line, just to see if there's anything worth pointing out up there. Pick up a bit of litter on the way as well. tide today should have gone out maybe about another 30 centimetres, it should have dropped another 30 centimetres. It was supposed to be a 0.3, not sorry, a 0. Point, yeah, a 0. 0.3. That means that it's at 30 centimetres above chart data. Right now it's more like a 0.6 or a 0.7 because these waves keep holding it back. This seaweed here is actually called lava. Make lava bread with it. And it is wickedly slippy. Oh hello. Scarp shell.
That's the first bit of plastic. There's a, if you've watched some of the videos before, you'll have heard me going on about this. I, I champion something called Take 5. And that means that when you're out on the shore, out on the bank, out on a walk in the woods, anything like that, whenever you're out and about, spend five minutes or pick up five items of plastic waste. So it doesn't take, it doesn't take no time out of your day. I mean, I'm, I'm walking back to the van now. So I'm just gonna keep my eye out. And if there's any plastic washed up on a high tide line like this, I'll pick it up on the way back and stick it in a bin. Every little helps. I have the lobster that I found. Oh, I tell you what, I am windburnt. Oh, it was a rough one today. I have the lobster that I found earlier on the shore. It's just been happy there at the bottom of the fridge. They're perfectly happy up to like a couple of days in the bottom of the fridge. You just need to keep them damp and cool. The best way that I've found to do that, like I say, is just a vegetable drawer. And this is this is an old t-shirt that I've just went and put a tea towel or anything. They just need to be damp and cool. Just like on the shore when you find them in like the caves and little crocs and crannies, they're high and dry out of the water, they're just damp and cool. Now, the cooking on the shore, what I would normally do is I would cook it with seawater. Because I'm cooking it at home, I haven't got any seawater, so I'm just going to use fresh water and add some salt to it. Now, we'll always dispatch crabs and lobsters before we cook them. On the shore, there's one way of doing it. This is my preferred method at home. The most humane method that I know. And all I'll do is I'll wrap it up in that towel and I'll put it in the freezer for five minutes. Chills them right out, just straight to sleep. I'll get the water up to a full rolling boil on the stove. Put the dispatched lobster in. By the time the water comes back up to a full rolling boil, two more minutes after that and it's done. It's ready to come off. What I will do then is I will put it in the sink and I will run cold water over it. Now when you're going to eat them straight away, it doesn't matter because you're eating while they're hot. But it retains heat. So the lobster will keep cooking afterwards. So if you don't cool it down, it will overcook. I'll pick it, put it in a bowl, put it in the fridge, and me and James will have it tomorrow. Let's get cracking. There you are, that there is a proper fierce, that there is a proper rolling boil. I'll get the lobster from the freezer now, get it straight in the pan. There you look. Properly chilled out. Yeah, perfect. Straight in the pan. There you go. Back up to the rolling boil. Two more minutes, ready to come out. That method works for any size crab or lobster. Because the larger the animal, the longer it takes to come back to the rolling boil, so it cooks for longer. There we are, a couple of minutes of that. Still holding a little tiny bit of heat. Myself to see how fast I can get it done. What we have done in the past is I've kept these shells and we've gone around to gyms and we've made a bisque. But I've actually <laughs> I've got like three lobsters worth of shelves in the freezer, so we don't need to keep any. I hope you enjoyed joining us. I hope you found it interesting. All the very best. See you later.